news editors about how that would manifest in our reporting and, you know, that we should really um, be seeking a place of intercultural understanding because it's always cyclical racism. There's always someone to pick on. And those conversations never used to go very far, is all I'll say. Anyway, our youth did come back to us with a solution. It's one I've just touched on, and what they want is more education and intercultural understanding, promoting a better understanding of all of our cultures. Um, and I'm happy to say that at least that's creeping into some, some school curriculums now where, where we are learning about, I guess, our, how our differences um, really also create so many similarities and finding the similarities in those difference and differences. And, and that, I really think, uh, creates a we are them kind of um, picture. So back to Peter Block, uh, he says this dividedness in our community is what makes it so difficult to create a more positive or alternative future, especially when that culture is more interested in individuality and interdependence and independence than in interdependence. He says our biggest work is to overcome that fragmentation. But what he, interestingly, the way he sets about achieving that and the way he uh, guides the rest of us to do that is through small groups with one gathering at a time where each gathering becomes an example of the future that we'd like to create. So the small group is where that transformation takes place. Large-scale transformation takes place, he says, when enough small shifts lead to that larger change. And small groups have the most leverage when they meet as part of a larger gathering, which is what I think the Jewish community do better than anyone else. So communal possibility and transformation can only occur through those small gatherings. So I guess to summarise his work, what he's saying is that the power of a small group cannot be overemphasised. And... It can't be overemphasised because what it actually allows us to do is to hear every voice within that group. The evidence actually shows that it's groups of three to 12 where intimacy is created and that intimate conversation makes the process personal and perhaps creates a more truthful dialogue. And importantly, it provides a structure where the experience of belonging is created ultimately. And I think really there is immense value in knowing that we are part of something that's bigger that our concerns are shared not just within our immediate environment but often much further afield. Within that social cohesion unit that I've uh, been referring to, the research uh, is already indicating that this is not a problem of whole communities in our society but of a small number of individuals and their social networks and that there is no single pathway for those drawn to violent extremism. And while we know that resilient communities are also connected communities, perhaps we feel it is our youth that hold the key to that communal transformation where the need to understand each other transcends one of our favourite national sports and that is having a good old fashioned problem or something uh, to whinge about. Uh, and what we feel, I guess, and um, a lot of the community forums that we've had, not just with our youth but um, of a wider nature, uh, really indicate that most or more often than not, individual actions are serving a higher cause. And what we'd like to do is ensure that that cause is one that might benefit humanity as a whole. Because most of us do find a cause to champion in our lifetime. Uh, more often than not, the individual's cause serve a higher cause than ourselves. And so through that, we go from I to we, and we look at what be, can be created together because that understanding of ourselves is the reinforcement of our identity. But within the context of a community, it's where the real sense of belonging can be achieved. Uh, the most cohesive societies are those which secure every member's right to belong. That is, uh, I'm going to lead to another buzzword, social capital. And that's how we measure the health of a community. It often refers to the collective value of social networks and inclinations that arise from these networks to do things for one another. So basically, it's how reciprocity uh, occurs within a community. I guess it's the old, you know, um, I don't know if anyone remembers this time, but I know when I lived in Elwood, I, was, I had wonderful Jewish neighbours. In fact, the entire building um, um, were wonderful Jewish couples and we did do the whole, uh, you know, we actually bought chickens together and we used to, you know, a cup of sugar and, uh, you know, milk and all of that. And, and that, those kind of social networks are unfortunately disappearing. Uh, I find it really difficult to engage even with the neighbours in my apartment block and unfortunately this is I guess what's needed to thread our community at a time where we are more fragmented than ever. 
So I guess it, it comes down to valuing our interdependence, but at the same time acknowledging our, our sense of belonging. And we can only do that through creating these really vibrant networks with one another. Uh, I wanted to just um, finish off by, um, by talking about one uh, community that do have a very specific uh, relationship of ownership and custodianship to land and country that has no equivalent uh, among any of our immigrant communities but practice social cohesion better than any of us. Uh, that is our Indigenous community. They practice it through spiritual, physical, social and cultural connections. And an interesting facet of our Indigenous community is that the domain of Western ideals in which the Indigenous uh, population, um, uh, I guess, ensconced within, they do not seek to adopt them as a community, which means that they don't play to that model of individualism. They play to collectivism and um, connected connectedness. And that really feeds uh, directly into the work of a wonderful anthropologist that we're also um, being inspired by at the VMC, and this will be my conclusion, I promise. Uh, her work is Margaret Mead, and uh, right after the 9-11 attacks, some various approaches were explored um, around her work, and that was with the aim of bringing our world back together, if you like. Uh, she, um, I guess, basically steered us towards an important conclusion that by cherishing the cultural diversity of the world, we cherish our own. And within that diversity lays the hope for human survival because we all have a right to be there together, coexisting, and more than that. And I guess, uh, yeah, for me, um, when I relate my own experience of identity, I think about how for so many years when I was growing up, I really didn't want to know my, uh, I really didn't want to acknowledge or be part of or own any of my identity. I didn't want to identify as a Greek Australian because at that time it wasn't seen as something cool. And I can really remember the painful experience of being the only um, Greek at my Catholic school and uh, along with my brother and sister who joined in, in time. And I remember the first time I was called a wog and spat on. And that was just to walking to the local playgrounds. It was a few hundred metres from home. And I remember really at that time, I was just really ashamed to own my own heritage. And that's why I was always very keen to keep my last name when I was uh, working in the media, so uh, that I could really strongly identify with that. And that's why I guess I will always feel a profound empathy for those going through the same thing. I know people have experienced far worse than I have, uh, but that's been my, that's just been my experience and it's the only thing that I can draw from. And it certainly does give me, um, I guess, um, a natural empathy towards um, our various communities and what they've triumphed and how resilient they've become as a result and how wonderfully well uh, they work together to support incoming communities who might be facing those challenges in years to come. In the recently released Scanlon Foundation survey, which is the only longitudinal study of its kind in Australia, I'm not sure if anyone was here at the Scanlon Foundation results, 85% of us actually support the term multiculturalism uh, and the concept of multiculturalism. As, as you can see in that video, uh, that's what we'd probably refer to as everyday multiculturalism. So the people on the street are largely in support of the concept, but it really does have a couple of different entities. It plays out in policy quite differently to what it plays out on the street. So. Um, and the policy speak, of course, is always linked to what's happening in the wider world. So we've still got a lot of work to do there. Uh, I'll just leave the final word to Margaret Mead, uh, who pioneered this way of thinking around cultural groups and diversity at a time when no one else did. She said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you. Thank you, Helen, and I'll just call on our executive member, Francis Prince, to give the vote of thanks. On behalf of the Jewish Community Council of Victoria and all of us here, um, I'd sincerely like to thank you, Helen, for the most informative talk about the very important work um, that you do and lead at the VMC. I have to say, I love the combination of both of you tonight. <laughs> um, it was just incredible, first of all, um, to hear from Kate about the um, legal foundations, the legal safeguards um, and systems and protections that we have in place and um, coupled together with the building of relationships within communities and across communities, um, it really is a winning and stellar combination that I think augurs well for the future. Um, 
I have to say that um, I, I don't know who else attended. Last, yesterday was the Faith Community Council of Victoria had their annual conference. And so much of what you said, Helen, really echoed very similar sentiments that are expressed yesterday. And for those who were there, we heard the thoughts um, by a wide variety of Australians um, who came from all sorts of religious and cultural backgrounds, how they felt that their identities fit into multicultural Australia. And they talked about not just one or two identities, but multiple identities that we have here. And you know, people talked about which identities are stronger. And it's not always clear that sometimes in certain contexts and circumstances, one is stronger than the other. And um, people were talking about there are also tensions between perhaps religious cultural identities and civic identities um, and what can be done about that. Um, and I think that I loved your title there, we are all one and the same. And I thought, mm, and then it had, but different. And I really, that um, sums it all up, and especially when you said um, the right to belong. No matter who you are and where you come from and what you practice and what you believe, we have the right to belong in Australia. And I just want to finish um, with the words, actually, that you've already mentioned, um, the Honourable Robin Scott, um, our Minister for Multicultural Affairs in Victoria, on a recent friendship walk conducted by the Jewish Christian Muslim Association of Australia. We had a friendship walk from a church to a synagogue to a mosque. And the Honourable Robin Scott opened the event with, the, with these words. He said more than this, but these are the words that I'd just like to finish off with and thank you with these, because your, both your work um, really express these sentiments. We here in Victoria don't tolerate differences we celebrate them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. I should have paid attention. <laughs> One of, if you've had a chance to read the report, one of the things that activities that the uh, JCCV um, held this year, that we're very proud of, was a JCCV LGBTI youth video competition. Uh, the Jewish Community Council of Victoria recently formed a JCCV LGBTI um, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex young advisory group called JADE, Jews All Diverse and Equal. And Jade's inaugural project was a youth-led video competition with cash prizes of up to $200. Now, this competition was supported by a, count, uh, a grant from the Youth Affairs Council. Um, and uh, the competition was open to young people of any sexual orientation or gender identity. And entries were split into two groups, students from year 9 to year 12 or age 14 to 18, and young adults aged 18 to 25, and there were prizes given to each. And I'd like to call on Doron Abramovici, the executive member with responsibility for social inclusion and a long-time member of the JCCV LGBTI reference group to tell us about the winners of that competition. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, so the first place um, in the young adults 18 to 25 category um, was given to well, yeah. <laughs> um, was given to Stephanie Lane, a 24-year-old um, who edited and produced the video, while 16-year-old um, Dimitri Coco Jane told the story in the film. And the first place in the students category uh, was given to a 12-year-old media student um, at King David, Michaelia Webb. So over the next week, an invitation to, uh, to participate in the creation of a final video at the, um, produced by the JCCV will be sent to the winners. Um, so as you recall, the video will be used across Victoria to support social inclusion and social cohesion. Um, we'll now be watching um, one of the videos uh, um, for the next uh, meeting um, and host... So, yeah, so David...
There was no sound then, was there? Shame. Not, for, not so much. This is my friend Blake, and this is his story. Coming on and trying to tell us that your lifestyle is correct. You behavior one practices is a choice. We may have certain tendencies, but how we behave and how we carry out our behavior. It was disgusting. It was absolutely disgusting. And listen, even though culture changes and the court may change, God's word never changes. He designed marriage. He knows how to best operate. Why can't I just be normal? So I've been, it's been hard trying to accept myself, not been easy. I just want to be normal, but I'm sort of sitting on the washing machine, isn't it? Well, he goes. My name's Blake. I like languages, anything <laughs> fine, really, culture. Um, but that's all that needs to be known for now. But there's more to it, isn't there? I'm just not ready to know if I'm ready to accept myself for, for anything for that matter. In an attempt to decrease the pain Blake had been feeling to figure out his identity, I encouraged him to go to a friend's 18th, but soon upon our arrival, he was asked to dance. What if this isn't really who I am? She's really, really pretty. Maybe I'm straight, but how will society perceive me? So today, to help Blake on his own journey, I decided to introduce him to some of my friends who got their own troubles coming out. Hey! hey. Hi, girl. I'm good, how are you? Good, sir. I'm 16 and I am a full-time high school student. Today I decided to come talk to Blake because I completely understand his position and where he's coming from. I was in that position myself and I know how hard it is and how much you struggle and how painful it can be when you think that no one's going to accept you for how you, who you are and how you feel and who you love. We are all people, we are all human. Just because our sexuality is different does not mean that we ourselves are worth any less and we are all exactly the same with just little differences here and there and I hope he can understand that and I also hope he understands that although coming to terms with your sexuality is definitely the hardest part actually living your life as a heterosexual or whatever you are isn't actually that difficult and people will generally be accepting and the ones who aren't are far outweighed by the ones who are Hi. Hello. Maybe about a year ago, at this time, I remember it was very cold, and um, there was this party in near the city. Before the party, I looked up who was going on the Facebook page. 
As I was strolling through the people, I noticed someone who I thought looked rather nice. That was him. <laughs> and you were dancing a lot. A lot, lot. Um, so when there was an interlude and you sat down, I decided to sit down next to you. You told me I looked really cute. Yes, okay. And I was... You said, you too. And we've been together ever since. Yes. Hey, so can I have anything else to eat or drink? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm just not eating recently. I got 